Although I love and feel very confident in my personal investing strategy, there is more than one way to be successful in the market. And today I've invited Hamish Hodder onto the channel to share some investing wisdom with all of us. And let me tell you, there's some gold in this interview. So get ready to take some notes. Let's do this. Hey there, welcome. If we're meeting for the first time, my name is Steven Spicer, and my goal is to help you build your rapidly growing, highly diversified net worth. And to do that well, it's important that you find an investment strategy that works for you. Many of you are familiar with my unique investment strategy as I share bits and pieces of it with you in my top stock pick videos. My strategy works for me, but it may not work for everyone. To find your unique strategy, it's important that you learn from many different successful investors and then adapt based on your own personal style and understanding. Now, there are a lot of finance YouTubers these days that you can learn from, but I'd like to draw your attention to one who I respect for his methodical and disciplined approach. And as you already know, I'm talking about Hamish Hodder. I know you can learn a lot from his strategy. So in this interview, I'm gonna have him break down exactly what he looks for in a company and why. Uh, but first, I'll let him introduce himself. Hamish, could you give us a brief introduction specifically regarding your background in finance? Hey guys, I hope you're doing well. Special thank you to Stefan for having me on his channel. I very much appreciate the opportunity to talk about my story and who I am and that sort of thing. So my background in finance started all the way back in high school where we had this stock market game um, where you had to convert, you had to buy some stocks and see how they did over a three month period. Um, long story short, I did terribly in that game, but it really piqued my interest and fast forward a couple years, I started to invest in the stock market. After high school, I went on to study finance at university and I am currently 20 years old and am about 60% of the way through that course. And since then, I've just been using my university course as well as a lot of external reading and resources and that sort of thing to learn as much as possible about the stock market. And essentially about two years ago, I started to invest in the stock market. As of right now, I have a five figure stock portfolio and have averaged a realized rate of return of about 13% over the past couple of years. And in the last financial year, I averaged a return of 15%, which actually outpaced the S&P 500 by 2.5%. All right, yeah, well, it's exciting that you're pretty much just starting off and you seem to be starting off with some pretty solid footing. That should be somewhat inspirational to some of our viewers who are just getting started. So. Why did you end up bringing your investment knowledge to YouTube? Yeah, so about a year before I started making YouTube videos, I came across this other finance channel, this Australian finance channel that had about 200 subscribers. And I noticed that he was talking about topics that I was very interested in, and I was interested to see what he was gonna do with YouTube and why he was doing YouTube. So I watched him for the next year, and I just saw him grow, and I saw that it was possible to grow a substantial following just talking about something you're passionate about, an interest that you have. Um, and that channel is actually the Aussie Wealth Creation YouTube channel. They now have 10,000 subscribers. And I actually do a weekly podcast talking about finance and the stock market with him every Saturday. Um, so that's amazing for me. But really, he was what got me into YouTube and showed me that it was possible to talk about your passion and sort of build a build a, a following and I really like helping people and I like teaching people and making people aware of the benefits of following the strategies that the best investors in the world are following. So it really encouraged me uh, to get on camera and start making videos uh, and start talking about some of these topics. That really is cool that you've been able to start working with, with Brandon on that podcast. That, that must have been pretty exciting for you, maybe a little bit surreal. Uh, I'll link out to Aussie Wealth Creation in the description as well. Now, I'd like to get to the way you consider stocks. I think that's the part that will be the most helpful for viewers. All of your in-depth analyses seem to revolve around four key components. Could you explain those criteria and why they're important to you when analyzing potential investments? Yeah, so the criteria that I follow is really a very similar structure to the, the criteria that the likes of Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger use. And it basically comes down to these four key areas. The first is, and you can think of them as four M's. Uh, that's what Phil Town uses in his book, Rule One. He calls them the four M's. We've got meaning, moat, management, and margin of safety. And I, I'm not sure if Warren Buffett goes by those four M's, but these are the four areas that he focuses on uh, when he's investing. The first meaning, basically the company that you're investing in has to have some sort of personal meaning to you. And it also needs to be what in within 
what's called your circle of competence. So you need to be able to very much understand how the business operates, how it makes its money, how it spends its money, and how it keeps its money and that sort of thing. And understand at the very core what makes that business run. And that's the first component is ensuring that you really understand the businesses that you're getting into and that you're passionate about them so that you're going to be willing to learn more about them um, over many years. The second M is moat and that basically stands for economic moat and essentially what I mean by this is, is there some kind of intrinsic characteristic about the business that gives it a massive competitive advantage over the other businesses in its industry. An example of this is Google and I like to call this the industry standard moat. Basically, if you're gonna do an internet search, you're gonna go to Google search. You're not going to Yahoo, you're not going to Bing, or maybe you are, but you shouldn't be. You should be going to Google. And basically it means that everyone is automatically going to Google, makes it the industry standard, and it makes it very, very difficult for other, other search engines and other companies to compete with it. So that's the second M. The third M is management, and I like to see a management team that has one, it has skill, and then it also has integrity. And I use a number of metrics in order to analyze that. And then the fourth M is margin of safety. And basically the first three are about assessing the quality of the business. Is it a great business? Is it a business with a moat, a competitive advantage? Has it got a good management team? And then the last M is margin of safety. We need to buy it with a significant discount so that there's very little downside and all upside basically. We're looking for stocks that really shouldn't be going any lower. They're very dirt cheap at the moment and their price is not aligned at all with the quality of the business and how the business is performing at its fundamental level. We buy it at the bottom and then there should be heaps of upside and if it doesn't perform how we expect, we will still make a substantial return because there's only up to go. Wow, awesome. Thank you, Hamish. Uh, real quick, if, if you're appreciating this interview, getting some value from Hamish, let us know by hitting the like button. Show him some love for taking the time to come over here and share with all of us. Now, let's get back to the interview. Hamish, there was a lot in your last answer. Could you unpack some of the most significant parts for us? What is the process you undergo in assessing each of those important criteria? Yeah, so for that first M, meaning circle of competence, it, it's very subjective, but I, I essentially try and learn how the business works at its core. So you could think of a restaurant um, working in a number of different ways, but really what it, what it comes down to, there's a number of things. There's the staff, there's the food, there's the rented space, there's maybe the interior design if you're going to go that far. And then essentially it's just how much traffic can you bring in and how much are you going to charge these people in relation to your expenses. So with a restaurant, it's quite easy. There's not many moving parts, but when it gets into really big corporations, it can get quite difficult. So it's good to spend a lot of time breaking down each aspect of its business and trying to work out where its revenues come from, where its expenses are going and that sort of thing. Then we have the moat or the second M and to assess this, I like to look at it over two dimensions. The first is a qualitative moat. So basically I'm looking for some kind of intrinsic characteristic or quality about the business that is going to ensure that it remains competitive. Like I said, with the industry standard for Google, that sort of thing, sometimes it could be a brand, it could be a networking effect like Facebook where there's so many people on the platform that it's very difficult for someone to come in and directly compete with something like Facebook. And then I look at it on a quantitative lens. So I like to see that that qualitative moat is also backed up in the numbers. And the four key areas that I look at are revenue, earnings per share, equity, and free cash flow. And basically I'm looking for these four numbers to be growing at about 10 or 15% per year over a 10 year period. And then I look at the seven year average, the five year average, the three year average, and the one year average. And I like to see that their growth is getting stronger and stronger. And if we see that a company has 10% growth in all of these four areas, and it's also improving each and every year. So maybe they went 10%, 12%, 18%, 22% in the last year. So it's getting, it's ramping up. Then that tells us that they do have some kind of intrinsic uh, moat or some kind of competitive advantage that is allowing them to be so successful in their marketplace. Number three is management. How do I assess management? And again, I look at this over two lenses. The first is integrity. So I'm looking at the actual people in power. How much shares do they hold? Are their values aligned directly with the business? Uh, are they the founders? That's really great because it means that their vision for where the company is going is still um, calling the shots and they're still making decisions at the top of the business. 
And once we've sort of worked out that they have integrity, we look at the letters to the shareholders and a bunch of other things, then we wanna see if they have skill. And I look at this over two dimensions again. First, I like to see how good are they at investing their capital. So for all the money that they're bringing in, how are they investing it? And what return are they getting on those investments? And to assess that, I use what's called the ROIC, which is the return on invested capital. And this is exactly what it sounds like. It tells you what return they're getting on the capital that they're deploying, the investments that they're making. And then I need to see how they're managing their debt. And I just like to see that they've got debt under control and that they've been uh, managing, man managing it successfully over a long period of time. And that's how I assess the management. And then finally, for that fourth M, we need to do the margin of safety. And to work out a margin of safety, we first need to work out what the fair value of a company is. And essentially, I use a discounted cash flow to grow the company's earnings into the future. And then I discount that back depending on what kind of return we want to get. And that gives us a fair value. And then I discount that by 50%. So if the fair value is 100, I'm willing to pay $50 per share. That was amazing. Thanks for all that detail. Uh, one thing I love about Hamish is how disciplined he is. This is on display when you consider that he went almost seven full months into 2018 without purchasing a single stock. And even with the one that he finally did purchase, he describes it as a small speculative position. And now he deals primarily with large cap stocks. And if I were operating in that same space, I'd probably be in the exact same boat, having not really invested much after eight months of excruciating research. Uh, Hamish, could you elaborate on this and explain to my audience exactly what you're looking or waiting for? Yeah, so as I just explained, I have those four criteria, but it really breaks down into two camps. There's the three that are in one camp that is assessing the business. Do we have a great business? Does it have a competitive advantage that's gonna ensure that it's thriving for many years into the future? And then the other component is the price. And basically what I've been doing right now is that I've been looking into many, many different businesses, um, a lot that I analyze on my channel and that sort of thing. And I find really great businesses that have amazing numbers. They definitely have moats. Their management team has skill and integrity. Maybe I even understand the business completely. But then when it comes to that margin of safety, their prices are just way too high. And I'm finding that across the board with many businesses, except for a couple that I am actually investing in. So really, it comes down to that last criteria. We have great businesses in our marketplace, in the US market, in the Australian market, there's great businesses all the time, but are they at the right price? And I just think that a lot of them are very, very overvalued, or at least just sitting at their fair value where we can't get a 50% margin of safety. Well, I obviously appreciate that discipline and I hope others uh, will as well. It's not about finding 100 decent opportunities in which to invest, it should be about patiently waiting to find that handful of absolutely amazing opportunities. At least that sounds like uh, that's a similar aspect of, of our trading styles. Uh, that's a difficult trait to master. So thank you for emphasizing that and really putting it into practice and, and on display for all of us in your, your videos. Now in that vein, what would you say is the most important investing lesson that you've learned that's helped shape the disciplined investor that, that you are today? Yeah, so there's a lot of lessons that I've learned through investing even over the short period that I have for the past couple of years, but there was this one lecture by Warren Buffett that stood out to me and that I think really shaped the way that I invest right now. And essentially what he was talking about, he made this analogy between baseball and the stock market. So in baseball, if you're standing at the plate and you're batting, essentially if a ball comes near you or in your area, you have to swing at it. And if you don't swing at it, you're gonna get a strike. And Warren Buffett says that stock market is like baseball, except there's no strikes. You don't have to swing. So even if stocks are coming past you and that they look 80%, 90% like you could hit that and it would be a great hit, you just leave them all. You just leave them, leave them, leave them, leave them, leave them maybe even for a year like I did, I almost didn't invest for an entire year. And then eventually a stock's gonna come by you that is 100% going to make you 15% or more and you hit it and you just smack it out of the park. And that's the kind of investing philosophy that the greatest investors use and it's the investing philosophy that I use. I'm looking to invest in maybe 10 to 30 stocks in my entire lifetime, so not many at all. 
and I've only really found one business in my two years that I completely get behind and I talk about that many times in my videos because it's the only business that I've found that is a sure thing for me that I'm 100% going to make 15% and I'm more than likely going to make 20, 30, 40, maybe even more percent on it each and every year over the next 10 years. So that's the kind of investing philosophy that I like to follow and that came directly from that lesson or that lecture by Warren Buffett. And I think that was the last question that Stefan had for me. So a big thank you to Stefan for having me on and thanks to everyone for watching. And I hope you enjoyed listening to my story and listening to my strategy and that sort of thing. If you want to see me interview Stefan, that's going to be on my channel at the same time as today. So go check that out if you're inter interested. Thank you to everyone for watching and I hope you guys have a great day. And thank you, Hamish, for coming on and sharing. I, I love that analogy and you're so right. For my viewers, that's like my July's top stock pick. That's a company that I've written about and followed for years because once I found it, it was just a, a no-brainer investment for me. It seemed so obvious. That was one of my, my home runs and I knew it before I even took a position and that's an exciting feeling. Uh, but yeah, thank you so much for your time and wisdom, Hamish. And as Hamish mentioned, he interviewed me as well and that's over on his channel right now. I'll link to that in the top of the description. So go check it out. Show me some love over there. I hope you all found this helpful. If you're new here, I hope you can see the value of being a part of this community. So don't forget to subscribe and click the notification bell. I'll see you in the next video. Take care.